Hello, and welcome to this session, The Law of Obedience. This is an interesting lesson, and it's one that's going to cause you to really think for a few minutes. Obedience is an interesting word, and I think probably it's the right word. It's the word we want to use here. What we're really talking about is a person entering life, coming onto this planet that we're a part of, in the body that we're living in, and then taking a look at what happens. Here we are living in a situation, in a system, where everything operates in a very exact way. It's easy to understand that if a person hasn't done a respectable amount of studying, they would never understand the laws, and yet when a person does gain an understanding of the law, they have such tremendous respect for it that they're just almost naturally obedient to the law. And we must be obedient to the law if we're going to really make things happen and grow in our life. Each one of us has been designed to be a builder. We're designed with creative faculties, the likes of which you won't find in any other form of life so far as we know. And yet, it's a choice we have to make. So we're either going to build in wisdom or in ignorance. Now, according to our understanding of divine laws, I see the laws as divine laws. I really believe the law is God's uniform and orderly method, and it's God's modus operandi. Now, many people, when they learn that the science of living is governed by exacting laws, immediately assume that to live right is to live the hard way. Man, this is going to be difficult. They're afraid of a law that's exacting in its demands when it touches their relationship with the finer things. Yet these same people would not be willing that the law which governs human society should be modified in any way. They recognize the laws which govern social contact and activity must be properly enforced if organized society is to function harmoniously and safely. In other words, they recognize that government is for the good of mankind and that without it, human life and welfare would be in continual jeopardy. Now, if this is true of human government and established by constitution and law, it's even more true of divine government. And the more exacting the law, the more certainty, the safety, prosperity, and happiness of the individual who fulfills the law's demands. In the realm of science, no laws are more exacting than those which govern the science of mathematics. An accountant, even when he fails immediately to solve a problem, knows it can be solved only by calling into operation the exacting laws that govern all mathematical calculations. Were these laws subject to change, the solution of mathematical problems would be utterly hopeless. Now, perhaps in no way has religion gone so far astray as in the conception of understanding of God whether it be the God of the Christians or of the heathen. Bob, as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking the God of my upbringing was not a God that was a friendly God. It wasn't a God that I could relate to. It wasn't a God that I could understand or practice a relationship with because I didn't understand that it was a relationship with the law of life itself. It was a relationship with the law of my own being. And in fact, the God of my upbringing Later, I thought, well, maybe that God needs to attend some anger management classes because it was a capricious God that was not at all the understanding that I have now through these laws that we're talking about. And that God matured in my own mind as I began to realize that just as the universe demonstrates its perfection in the law of the farm, that if you want to grow a great crop, you get yourself in harmony and obedience with the law of the farm. You don't try to argue your way out of how nature works with growing a great crop. You get in harmony with it and you discipline yourself to plant at the right time, to till the soil just right, to clear the weeds, to create an environment in which what is natural naturally occurs. It was Tom Wilhite who once distinguished the difference between normal and natural. And he said, what is normal is the tendency we all have to live a certain way, with a certain paradigm and a certain way of experiencing life. But even though it's normal because we repeat it, it doesn't make it natural. And then he went on to distinguish what is really natural. And what is really natural for us is what is in harmony with our own nature. And what 
is our nature is unlimited abundance. What is in our nature is unlimited goodness. What is in our nature is unlimited life. And you and I are in the process of coming to understand and then, if you will, download or bring into time expressions of our unlimited nature that shows up as our dreams, our desires, the good we would like to bring forth in the world. You and I cannot do that, though, without an obedience in the practice of our way of being to our own nature. So while we have a normal way of living, unless it's in harmony with our nature, it is not natural. Well, you know, obedience is an interesting word, and I question whether everybody really does understand it. I think most people look at obedience as doing something because you're afraid not to do it, where what you were saying is that you do it out of such profound respect. And it is obedience that controls things in our life. If we look at it, our societies, our cities, our states, nation are supported by it. Our properties and lives are dependent upon it. We must be obedient. Because of our respect for obedience, we as a whole support it. But woe unto the person who tries to break through to pillage, to plunder, for selfish gain. As we look into the home, we see the mother training her child in habits of discipline. Tomorrow, we see a happy mother because her child has grown into youth and into adulthood and has earned success. Now, a success because back in the beginning of this person's life, the seed of obedience was placed there, which brought forth respect, obedience, and unselfish thought. If the mother was the knowledgeable mother, the mother of understanding, when they're teaching the discipline, they also understand that the child can grasp why they're being taught this. Even the child is doing it because of respect. It's not because of fear. Business is founded upon obedience, and as each member obeys the laws of commerce, they're going to succeed. It is only when a person expands these laws by over-speculation and by wildcat schemes, inflated values, or lack of cooperative agency that he brings upon himself failures and causes bankruptcies and loss. All our problems of life are due, in some measure, to our obedience to the law of thought and its creator. Our difficulties have been in knowing what to obey and what not to obey. Well, of course, if the question's there, it's because we don't know, and there's the only problem we really have is ignorance again. And the only way to overcome it is to study. I think, as we mentioned in the, one of the very early sessions, that freedom is our birthright, and if we're going to be free, we have to study, because we have to eliminate ignorance. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's only one thing to be set free from, and that's ignorance. We see in nature the answer. She has no troubles she cannot overcome. She has no problems she cannot solve. She has no burdens she cannot bear. No tasks she cannot perform. Why? All her operations are governed by the mighty law of harmony and order, which constantly removes every discord, which heals all diseases, which rights every wrong, which supplies every need. If in the winter a young sprout attempts to break through the soil before season, Mother Nature destroys the sprout. Yet at the same time, the very snow and ice that frees the little unruly sprout serves as a blanket of warmth and protection to the other seedlings complying with her laws. When the individual wishes to use nature in his work, such as farming or gardening, he must know how to comply with nature's laws. In turn, as he obeys her laws, he derives the best results, and in the end, he will enjoy the greatest harvest. He who obeys the laws of nature and acts as her obedient servant later becomes the master and reaps a full harvest. It's so true. We have to follow nature's way, and as we do, there's a big win in store for all of us. Hollowell goes on here and he says, every student who obeys the law, and you and I are students, we're students of life. Whether we choose to be consciously or not, we're still in this life school. And the power and the wonder of being a good student is that life unveils its gifts again and again and again with no limit. 
Every student who obeys the law and is a true servant of good, who is disciplined, obedient to the good, will become a greater soul and will reap the power to control every condition and enjoy every blessing. Think of that. If we simply get obedient to the law, become a good student of the law, practice it daily, life unveils everything for us. We become not only a greater soul, we begin to reap the power to control every condition and to enjoy every blessing. There's nothing more that you want than this. Our mistakes are largely due to the fact that we have obeyed more readily the laws of the earth than the laws of spirit, or that means the laws of circumstance, the things that we look outside ourselves. We have subjected our ideas to the outward appearance of things rather than to the inner truths that the law teaches or reveals. Now, if we choose to obey the spirit within rather than the conditions about us, then the law requires us to first think things into existence from within before we shall see them on the without. And this is truly the shift that Bob was talking about when he said most people live from the outside in. And the practice of empowerment, the practice of authority, the practice of becoming able to bring forth the circumstances that you would choose or I would choose is to learn to live from the inside out. So instead of waiting for things to change, we change. And over time, things must begin to match a vibrational harmony or compatibility with the frequency that we are living in and living from. Most of our experiences are the outgrowth of our own created activities. These created activities are first to be bound in thought, in the thought that we think in our minds. The law reads, as you sow, so shall you reap which is mathematically accurate and true. If you plant a turnip seed, nature doesn't produce potatoes. If you plant corn, nature doesn't make a big steak and bring you a big giant oak tree. On the same reasoning, if you or I plant thoughts of worry, the law we obey will give us something to worry about. It will produce more and more circumstances to fulfill our focus, which is worry. And if you think disease and lack then we increase our receptivity and we experience more and more of what we are interested in and focusing upon. Whatever law you obey will in turn serve you. The most important thing then is to know what to obey. Raymond Hollywell said, You may laugh at the troubles of little ones because you view them from their true value. To the child, his tiny tasks seem real and all-important. And not until he outgrows his childish ways can he look back with amusement and not feel regret. Not until we can rise superior to our problems and our troubles can we ever hope to cease to have further troubles. A mother put her little boy to bed one night. And later, she found him restless, unable to sleep. He called down and asked that she turn the light on for him. The mother knew something was wrong, so she went up to his room and gained his confidence by talking with him. And she learned that during the day, other children had threatened to send the boogeyman after him because he would not give up his toy to them. The mother then explained that there was no boogeyman. She said that the principle of it was to frighten him into submission so that he would give over his toy to the other children. She told him to go to sleep because there was no real boogeyman. The child had obeyed the illusion of things and was frightened, but the mother saw the truth. In knowing the truth, she could see through the principle of fear involved, and by dispelling it, from the mind of her son, enabled him to go peacefully to sleep. The purpose of our lesson is to learn how we might properly choose and serve the law for our highest good. We either serve principle or things in all that we think and do. Things are the events or the results of invisible causes, whereas principle is the true cause and is spirit. Principle is that which we think in our mind, and things are the result of those thoughts. A person who obeys illusions or worships things will have burdens to carry. A person's burdens are the things which they claim as their personal property. Things they feel are their very own and therefore must protect and serve them. Raymond Hollywell said, 
Years ago, a relative of mine worshipped illusions and things. He strove to accumulate riches. He worked so hard gaining his wealth that he lost his health. Then he turned about and tried to gain his health by spending his wealth. (laughs) There's a lot of people do this. And in the end, he passed away, a disappointed and disillusioned man. That man, like so many others, had started out in life with the wrong conception of the law of God. Strange, but man does not own an earthly thing. All that he has has been loaned to him according to his understanding of the law he serves. Man was born naked, and he dies in the same nakedness. I've often pointed out that we leave the world much the way we arrive. No hair, no teeth, no money. (laughs) Um, We never own anything. Everything we own, as Raymond Hollywell said, at the time of our death is going to belong to someone else. But what we are is ours forever. It pays to study. Bob, why I think you are such a powerful teacher and such a great mentor is that your teaching describes for us in exquisite ability the nature of the law and of life and of our own being. And you also clearly state to us that life is in an ever upward progressive expression that is seeking to express itself through every one of us, that the entire universe is in an evolving process of becoming. Now, what that means is that what looked like yesterday's problems, or when you were speaking of how we might look at a child's problems, a child's difficulties, a child's learnings, and we can see from an adult perspective, that child will get past that. Say we started a business and it was a million dollar business. Getting it from zero to a million dollars, there were things to learn, problems to overcome, difficulties to surmount. And as we applied the laws, we were able to grow a business from nothing to a million dollars. But then the vision is to grow it to $10 million. The difference between one million and 10 million brings with it a new set of learnings, understandings, applications where we have to get bigger than our paradigm about what 10 million means. And so having a challenge isn't the problem. It's what we think about the challenge that's the problem. When we are faced with a challenge, to see that as an opportunity to practice the law of obedience, to practice the law of our own understanding, expanding to an experience of bigger, larger, greater than the problem we're facing. And with that, the law of life does exactly what the law of life does, which brings the result that we're holding in mind and empowering, infusing, energizing with our own believing. The problems never go away. There's always going to be more. I always point out that the problems you have now, a few years from now, are going to seem small. If you think you've got big problems now, wait until next year. You're going to have bigger ones. If you don't understand it, that could be very discouraging. But if you do understand it, that's really good because you're going to raise your consciousness. If you had the problems today that you had five years ago, you'd probably be bored because they'd be simple things that you can pull off. Disobedience to the law is refusal to do what we know is right. We all know the right, but we do not always do it because it seems to interfere or delay our immediate attainment of the object we see. We want quick returns, forgetting that the law moves slowly, yet it works perfectly as well. We want instantaneous healing of our diseases, but we are loath to give up the net of habits that cause them. You know, there's a bit of a paradox because I believe what Raymond Hollywell is saying here is accurate, and yet it's by working with the law that we can take quantum leaps, which is an enormous jump ahead with very little effort, if any. When we really get in harmony with the law, we can manifest magnificent results in our life. When we speak of a person of principle, we mean a person who is governed by the law of right thinking and living, a person who is not easily swayed, a person who is not deviant from the path of what he deems to be right for the sake of personal profit or popular acclaim, a person, in short, who one may trust absolutely be true to his convictions, regardless of the temptations to change or modify them. No one will deny such a person inspires utmost confidence and may become a tower of strength and leadership. He is one on whom others rely for leadership, whereas the person who is easily persuaded to yield to pressure, even for kindly motives, is not the type of individual on whom we can depend. 
if this is true of a person in the outer realm, how much more true is it of the person in the inner realm, the mental realm? Because God is principle, not merely governed by principle. The God-governed individual is never in doubt as to the results to be gained by following the principle, for principle is based on law and obedience. So this law can have only one result, happiness, peace, and prosperity. That is a beautiful promise, and it really makes the studying of the law worthwhile. Absolutely. And that deep down, if we pay attention, we want what is in obedience to this law, because it is peace, happiness, prosperity. We want that. There's nothing we want more than to experience the fullness of life. So ultimately, what we really want is obedience to that which produces what's in harmony with what we want. Hallowell ends it this way, and he says, all that's required for us is to learn obedience to the law of truth. And as I'm reading this sentence, I'm thinking, Bob, about your teachings and what have spoken to me so much over the years, and that is that you use the word harmony when Hallowell uses the word obedience. You talk about being in harmony or out of harmony. And so if we think of obedience as bringing all of our faculties and all of our feelings in harmony with our desired good, in harmony with what we really, really believe is good, and we practice being in harmony, and any place where we're out of harmony, we shift that, we release that, we bring ourselves back into harmony. This is being obedient to the law, that we can have this experience of the presence of life, spirit, now. Not after we die, not tomorrow, now, if we practice bringing ourselves in harmony, practicing the law of obedience so that you and I absolutely want the good more than our problems. And, you know, as our friend Michael Beckwith says, take your mind off the problem, put it on God, stop telling God about your big problems, and tell your problems about your big God. That's a practice of obedience. This is Mary Morrissey. And this is Bob Proctor, and thank you.